It's time for you to grab the wheel, floor the accelerator, and take total control. We're giving you the keys to the world's wildest rides. On land, sea, and in the sky. And we'll discover the horsepower, technology, and all out guts required to operate these beasts. So suit up, strap in, and throw it into high gear. No learner's permit required. Now, driver's seat on Modern Marvels. If you're among America's 209 million licensed drivers, this is the driver's seat where you'll spend an average of four years during your lifetime. You may take the components for granted. Gear shift, steering wheel, accelerator, brake, mirrors. But there's an amazing array of other driver seats out there. In some of the world's most extreme vehicles. First up, let's test drive the Army's ultimate off-roader. The Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle. Think of it as a crossover between an armored personnel carrier and a full-scale battle tank. There's enough room for nine inside, like a roomy minivan. But don't expect the interior of this beast to be as user-friendly. It takes a little bit getting used to. It's a lot different than getting into any other vehicle, just because you got to watch the heavy hatch, make sure it doesn't close on you or anything, and then just kind of snake your way in. So, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. It's, it's not too bad once you sit in it. The first thing the driver notices is that he's practically sitting on the engine block. You've got a pretty thin wall separating you from the engine pack. Keeps you really warm. If you're in the desert, not so good, probably. In the older versions, they didn't really have any cooling system for the crew. So you were just, if you caught a breeze, that's what you got. The cozy confines aren't the only difference between the driver's seat of the Bradley and the one in a car. Instead of a steering wheel, there's a steering yoke. And though the accelerator and brake pedals are familiar, one key component is missing, a windshield. It's called what we call periscopes. They're really small uh, and narrow pieces of, of glass that are really thick. The periscope limits forward visibility to the 11 to 1 o'clock positions, a fraction of the 9 to 3 o'clock view afforded by the windows of a car but it's a small price to pay for the added security it provides on the battlefield. Besides, the driver can see plenty on the monitors, with feeds from high def, night vision, and thermal imaging cameras. Another car component missing from the Bradley, tires. Instead, it's equipped with tank-like tracks. They provide better traction and make the driving experience nothing like that of a car. In an automobile, when you were to take a left turn, you would slow down. But in this, in order to take a left turn, you have to press on the gas, because that's how the track works. But along with the challenges comes some fun. No car can do this. The tracks enable the tightest turning radius imaginable. That's 27 tons of vehicle turning on a dime. With that precision handling comes some pretty heavy-duty firepower. Sitting just behind the driver, the gunner fires away with a Bradley's high-powered machine gun and anti-tank missile launcher. And if anyone fires back, 
it's nice to know that the aluminum armor surrounding the crew can really take a beating. Able to withstand you know, several rounds of a 50 cal, point blank. We can take anything up to a direct hit from a missile. For a slightly roomier driver's seat, let's try out this heavily armored ride. Its official designation is the mine-resistant, ambush-protected military all-terrain vehicle. But soldiers learning how to operate it here at Fort Bliss near El Paso, Texas, call it the MRAP. All-terrain is for what is basically what you see out here. It's climbing mountains, uh, deserts, sand, snow, mud, anything you name is capable of encountering. Floor the accelerator of the MRAP and its 370 horsepower engine will speed up to 72 miles per hour. Not exactly blistering, but keep in mind that the MRAP weighs more than 12 tons, as much as four full-size SUVs. This vehicle is extremely fast compared to other military vehicles. Encasing the driver's seat is the MRAP's heavy-duty composite armor. It's just the protection the driver needs, since one of the MRAP's main purposes is to carry up to three soldiers on missions to clear minefields. All that armor also shields everyone on board from one of the deadliest hazards in the war zones of Iraq and Afghanistan. The Improvised Explosive Device, or IED. There's another feature that keeps the driver safe from IED blasts. Unlike the seat in a car or truck, this seat is suspended in midair. This driver's seat, if you notice, is not mounted to the floor at all. It's suspended by D-rings and harnesses in case of this vehicle gets an IED blast. By the seats not being mounted to the floor, the body doesn't absorb the full shock or the full blast. One statistic speaks to how well the MRAP protects the soldiers in the driver's seat. In 18 months of use in Afghanistan, MRAPs have reduced deaths and injuries by more than 30%. To face an entirely different type of combat in a much larger machine, let's take the wheel of the Oshkosh Striker 4500. No problem with visibility here. The Stryker 4500 is a colossal fire truck used to combat blazes at some of the largest airports in the world, like here at Dallas-Fort Worth International. The Stryker 4500 is not just a key tool, this is the tool. Without this tool, we wouldn't be able to rescue living passengers out of a burning aircraft. And that's what we're here for, is to save lives. Fires that result from plane crashes can be the deadliest of all. Jet fuel can burn at temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the Stryker is designed to allow its one and only operator to fight a fire without ever leaving the driver's seat. But first things first. Step one is driving to the site of the fire. And that's no easy task. The airport is mainly concrete, but Airplanes don't always crash on the concrete, so this, this course here trains drivers on how the truck actually handles going up and down slopes, going through thick mud. Imagine going off-road in a vehicle as long as a four-story building that weighs as much as 20 pickup trucks. But thanks to the Stryker's eight wheels, each operating on an independent axle, the driver can maneuver some pretty tough terrain. It's pretty stable for how big it is. There's not a lot of places that it can't go. Although driving this massive truck does take some getting used to. The way these axles are set up, they both turn at the same time, so you kind of feel like you're drifting when you turn the, turn the vehicle. So an ordinary person would feel like the truck was out of control when they drive this. Once the driver masters steering the striker, it won't take long to get to the scene of the fire. It's got a top speed of 70 miles per hour. Once at the scene, 
the driver takes hold of this joystick, which gives him control of this turret hose mounted on the front bumper. Then he unleashes up to 1,200 gallons of water a minute. As first unit on, my main priority is to create a point of egress for the passengers. I want to make sure they have an escape corridor that they can get out and not get burned. Storage tanks holding 4,500 gallons of water help accomplish that mission. That's why they call it the Stryker 4500. After extinguishing the burning plane's exterior, the Stryker driver has to put out the blaze inside the fuselage. To do that, he uses this control, which extends a 50-foot boom. Then he remotely controls a device on the end of the boom called a snozzle, which pierces the plane's skin, then spews out more water or foam inside the cabin. Total elapsed time for the Stryker 4500 to put out most airplane fires? Just two minutes. And hopefully, all from his seat, this driver has saved hundreds of lives. But this isn't the only driver's seat capable of dousing a raging inferno. We'll take flight in this one and do the job with a touch of one button. Nearly 90% of American adults have a driver's license. But some of the coolest driver's seats on Earth require a pilot's license. And from this seat, a pilot can launch an assault on a very hot threat. An average of 80,000 wildfires erupt in the U.S. every year, many in the dry expanses of the American West, areas so vast and remote that the best countermeasure comes by air. At Victorville Tanker Base in California's San Bernardino County, the crew that mans this converted commercial jetliner preps for that challenge every day. Before takeoff checklist. Before takeoff checklist. Ignition. This is the DC-10. Its length is 181 feet, wingspan 165 feet, and it's just like the aircraft that used to carry passengers, except for one big difference. The difference is these massive tanks. They hold 12,000 gallons of water or foam retardant, which can be dumped on a raging wildfire in a matter of seconds. That means this aircraft doesn't accept any additional passengers. This is the inside of our DC-10. In passenger configuration, it carried 350 passengers. All the seats, carpeting, and paneling has been removed. And my job as a pilot takes place up here in the cockpit. Now, where, where it may take just one person to drive an, an automobile, a car, in this plane we have, it takes three people, pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer. We all have specific duties that we perform to lead to successful operation. Today, the three-man crew of this firefighting wide body is conducting a training exercise. Before getting airborne, they must make sure every inch of the plane is functioning properly. Ignition. Off. Heat on heat. GAT. Engine anti-ice. Off. Before start check this Just prior to takeoff, the pilot punches the coordinates of the fire into the onboard GPS much like the GPS units available for most cars. As for lifting off the runway, that's a bit more complicated than pulling out of a driveway. The control panel of a jetliner makes the dashboard of a car look like a kindergarten toy. Computer. Takeoff requires thrust, and that's what this throttle control beside the seat is for. Push forward, and each of the DC-10's three engines thunders with 40,000 pounds of thrust, more than enough to get this plane airborne.
Once at altitude, the pilot controls the plane largely with a yoke, which resembles a steering wheel with more movement. Turn the yoke left or right to move the ailerons on the wings up and down, making the jet bank to one side or the other. Pull the yoke back or push it forward, and the elevator on the jet's tail moves up or down, making the jet climb or descend. That covers the flight basics, but the water drop requires more support. That comes from the pilot of a scout aircraft near the fire zone, who offers advice on the best angle of attack. Then it's all up to the DC-10 pilot to make a run as low as 200 feet above the flames and drop the load of water with pinpoint accuracy. We have three separate tanks. So what we're going to call out to the captain is we have three tanks set at 50%, coverage level five, and these will all be five, three green lights. Pre-drop checklist is complete. Stand by. Every move this crew makes has to be perfect. When they're over the target, the press of one button relays the drop sequence to the storage tanks. Coming up to our drop start point. We hit that button, that button's live now. Drop. Drop. The crew can program the tanks to drop their 12,000 gallons of water in a drizzle covering a wide area, or a downpour confined to a specific zone. But shedding 50 tons of water in just eight seconds can send the plane swooping upward like cresting up the hill of a roller coaster. And it's up to the pilot to instantly adjust. We're dropping. I'm using my left thumb to push the trim, to trim the nose down. And I'm pushing on the yoke forward because the loss of weight transfers the center of gravity and the plane wants to leap up into the air. Months can pass between wildfires, but during peak fire season, the Victorville tanker crew might fly as many as eight or nine missions in a single day. Weekly training runs like this one keep them sharp until that crucial time arrives. DC-10 in the firefighting role has been the most satisfying flying I've ever done. Uh, not only do we get to enjoy the flying of flying a large aircraft close to the ground and flying it closer to its limits, but we also get to do something that is helping. For an airborne driver's seat with a little less heat, take to the skies in the serene cockpit of a helium-filled airship. Behold the Eureka, one of a new generation of German-made Zeppelins. With a semi-rigid frame, it's 14 feet longer than a 747, and each of its 14 seats aboard, including the pilots, is first class. It's not a blimp. It is an airship, and the main difference is that a blimp is a envelope with no rigid structure inside, with the gondola suspended from the envelope. In our case, we have a rigid airframe made of aluminum and carbon fiber. Unlike a blimp, the engines are attached to its semi-rigid frame far above the cabin, not to the cabin itself. Based near San Francisco, it flies sightseers over Silicon Valley. Look at this incredible view. You don't find that in an airplane, for example, or in a helicopter. And it's not so loud. I mean, we can even have a nice conversation. Any licensed pilot who takes a two-day training course can test out this driver's seat for a 30-minute flight. Roger. We've had everything from 747 captains with 30,000 hours all the way down to private pilots with, you know, 100 or so hours. But all of them say, you know, it's just like nothing else that they've ever flown. This airship combines characteristics from an airplane, a helicopter and a balloon all in one. What makes flying the Eureka unlike most aircraft is that its three 200 horsepower engines can rotate up to 120 degrees. Using joysticks, the pilot can control precisely how much each one pivots. We can go in a hover, that means we can stand still over a certain point. 
and be able to make like uh, left-right movements, 360 for example. That is similar to a helicopter, but the controls are way different. And so is the top speed. The Eureka maxes out at about 80 miles an hour. And though the pilot can take this ship to an altitude of 10,000 feet, he's likely to stay much closer to the ground. That's because, like a child's balloon on a windy day, an airship is at the mercy of air currents and thermals. And pilots have to adjust accordingly. You really have to feel what the air is doing to the, to the ship. And it's not so much uh, physically demanding to fly. Like the other blimps, they have pedals and wheels, and it's really physically demanding. Um, this is far more mentally demanding. You really have to fly it by the seat of your pants. But for the few veteran Zeppelin pilots around the world, that's not the catch. That's the fun. If this driver's seat just seems too tame, buckle up tight for a stomach-turning flight in one of the deadliest flying machines on Earth. Imagine a high-tech vehicle so difficult to operate that learning the ropes takes even the most experienced drivers two years. That's the challenge for every licensed helicopter pilot who wants to grab the reins of the U.S. Army's AH-64 Apache Longbow. But this driver's seat is in the back seat. The design was with the tandem seat and the back seater, his primary focus is actually piloting or flying the aircraft while the front seater is conducting the majority of the reconnaissance and attack operations. With the pilot seated behind the gunner, the Apache is ready for action. Yeah, I want to be ready, you're clear. Designed to protect ground troops by launching devastating assaults, this machine is a flying tank. The primary function of the Apache is to uh, deal death and destruction on the battlefield. The Apache has the distinct honor of being the most lethal attack helicopter in the United States inventory. We can carry more, go farther, go faster than any other helicopter. The Apache can soar as fast as 167 miles per hour and as high as 15,000 feet. It can also execute evasive maneuvers impossible for most helicopters, including barrel rolls and loops. Any pilot who begins training on the Apache has already earned his wings as a chopper pilot. But for those whose experience might be limited to the freeways, here's an idea of the basics. The key instrument in the cockpit is the cyclic control stick. It gives the pilot control over the helicopter's four rotor blades, which are essentially rotating wings. Moving the stick causes the rotor blades to tilt, which changes how much lift they provide. Adjusting the tilt equally for all the blades lifts the helicopter straight up and down. Changing the tilt for some of the blades creates uneven lift, causing the helicopter to climb, dive, or turn. But controlling an Apache requires more than just skill. It also takes nerves. Flying this chopper is so sophisticated, and the enemy territory traversed is so hostile, that pilots refer to it as riding the dragon. In the eyes of the enemy, the Apache is a very dangerous helicopter. Uh, in the eyes of uh, friendly forces, it's also a very, very dangerous aircraft to learn how to fly. Typically, a, an aviator will go through approximately anywhere from a year and a half to two years of flight training from start to finish to become an Apache pilot. One of the most difficult things about flying the Apache is having to constantly shift focus from one eye to the other because the helmet is fitted with a monocle that's fixed in front of the pilot's right eye. Twelve different instrument readings from the cockpit are projected onto the monocle screen. Other images can be superimposed there, 
from those shot by the helicopter's cameras to radar information. While the pilot's right eye is interpreting all that data, his left has to be free to scan outside the aircraft for threats. All the while, sensors are detecting exactly where his monocled right eye is looking. Just move the monocle's crosshairs on a target below, and the weapons he selects will swivel and aim precisely where he's looking. I think uh, the biggest thing that everybody asks us about is, is if the gun really does follow the line of sight of where the pilot's looking, and it absolutely does. The Apache's arsenal includes the M230 automatic cannon mounted under the fuselage. It can take out a target more than two miles away. It can shoot in excess of 600 rounds a minute. Uh, we, we don't generally do that, but it also, uh, I like to compare it to each round has almost the capability of a single grenade. With the touch of a button, the pilot can also deploy a variety of smaller missiles and free flight rockets usually mounted and fired from underneath the wings. But the most powerful weapon at his disposal is the AGM-114, aptly known as the Hellfire missile. This is uh, that's a missile that'll penetrate any known armor on the battlefield, and this thing will reach out and touch you five miles plus. Pinpoint accuracy. For all the onboard firepower, one of the most reassuring aspects of flying an Apache is the blanket of security that protects the crew. The windshield is made of reinforced glass that can withstand every type of small arms fire. And the pilot's seat is covered in a heavy duty layer of Kevlar. This aircraft withstood significant damage in both Iraq and Afghanistan. A lot of uh, small arms fire, RPG fire. I think some of the newer features that are just, that make this aircraft as amazing as it is, is its, its capability to stay in the fight for long periods of time, its ability to take you know, an excessive amount of enemy fire and still stay in the fight and provide that capability to guys that desperately need it. It's what makes the Apache one of the military's most advanced and most celebrated aircraft. For a thrill ride without the heights and the two-year training course, Let's try on the wintry speed machine, owned by nearly two million Americans. The main allure to riding snowmobiles, jumping snowmobiles, hill climbing snowmobiles is the adrenaline rush. I think that's what drives most people. Um, everyone sets out goals and, and they want to jump higher, climb higher, go faster than they've ever even dreamed possible. Racing souped up models up to 150 miles per hour and riding big air like these experts isn't for the average weekend snowmobiler. But it's a ton of fun, even without pushing the envelope. And driving isn't that complicated. Unlike your car, snowmobiling's a little bit different where the controlling of the vehicle are done with your fingers as opposed to your feet. Uh, as you can see on my snowmobile, I've got a thumb lever for the gas, and then I also have a finger lever for your brake. Pressing down the gas lever engages the snowmobile's belt track, which operates on a friction system similar to the Bradley fighting vehicle. Once the belt track is engaged, how extreme the ride gets is up to the driver. There are virtually no limits in terms of climbing, no limits in terms of handling, and as far as jumping these things, I mean, they've got so much power. The only thing limiting a rider is their own nerve. You can carve these snow wheels through deep powder just like it was water. And who needs snow? With a little creativity in the right parts, the snowmobile can be modified to drive virtually anywhere. There's truly nowhere a snowmobile can't go. You put a few wheels on, on the skis, um, a flat track, you can take it to the asphalt, you, you can extend the, the track, uh, put a bigger lug on it, take it to the mountains, 
or you can take your seat off and, and um, use your standard track and walk across water. So with a few simple mods that anybody can do at home, snowmobile can go anywhere. We'll compare the freedom of this driver's seat to a vehicle that's a real heavyweight. How does 8 million pounds of machine sound? Say hello to one of the largest mega machines on the planet. The 850 Dragline Crane. The 850 Dragline, and two others just like it, do the heavy lifting at this phosphate mine in Aurora, North Carolina. This machine weighs a whopping 8 million pounds. Thunders with 8,000 horsepower. It sports a boom as tall as the Statue of Liberty. The amazing thing about it is it's operated by one man and that little perch over there. Like the driver's seat of a car, the Dragline 850 is equipped with a windshield that allows the operator to watch out for any potential dangers, with one big difference. In a car, his attention is usually directed ahead. Here, he needs to broaden his focus. In a car, you're kind of looking forward to see what the next driver is going to do, and here you don't have to worry about that. You're kind of always looking down and looking off to your right or left out of these two windows to see if anyone has pulled within, in, up in your swing path. Right here, this is kind of like a, your car steering wheel right here and your brake pedals down here. The foot pedals swing the enormous boom from side to side. Levers on the left control the boom's vertical movement. And a panel on the right manipulates the giant bucket. Every scoop is 52 cubic yards of dirt and rocks, enough to fill a two-car garage. In order to be competitive in this business, you have to move a lot of materials. And so the key to it is the amount of ore that these big guys can pull out of the ground. Every scoop contains phosphate, a substance vital to the production of everything from toothpaste to soft drinks to flat screen TVs. Mining it all is a costly endeavor. And a huge chunk of that expense is the electricity that powers each of the mine's three drag lines. It's all electric. So our electric bill here at Aurora is around $3 million a month, and this machine consumes a large part of that. Who knew consuming electricity could be so much fun? Oh, yeah, it's fun to get on them. I mean, it's like being on a battleship when you're in the back and you can't see out and it's rotating around. So, yeah, they're definitely amazing pieces of equipment. This driver's seat may be a bucket full of fun, But out on the farm, this machine is the pick of the crop. It's the 32-ton custom-built 440-horsepower carrot harvester, designed and used by Bolthouse Farms in Bakersfield, California. This mega machine is the only one of its kind and driving it might seem highly complicated. But the truth is, the Bolthouse Harvester virtually drives itself. We just turn on the machine pretty good and we turn on your GPS and your screen, make sure everything's okay and we're ready to go. Like most high-tech harvesters today, this giant carrot plucker has a specialized GPS navigation system that keeps it almost flawlessly aligned with every row. So the driver can just sit back and enjoy the three mile per hour ride. You're steering, you're steering free. <laughs> you don't gotta use steering no more. If he does have to make an adjustment, it's always tiny. And all it takes is one finger on this touch screen. Unlike driving a car, the trick is to not keep eyes on the road, but on the instruments. Well, in a car you gotta see, cause you're looking straight. On these machines, you gotta look down because you gotta keep it pretty much straight to see where you're at. So see like right now, right here, I'm moving just about a half an inch to my left. So I gotta go half an inch to the right so I could get lined up 
Looks like we'll pick up all the carrots from the front end pretty good. Another big difference between a car and the bolt house harvester is when it reaches the end of the field and the driver needs to stop. Don't look for the brake pedal. There isn't one. That's because the harvester is equipped with a hydrostatic transmission. That means pressure from hydraulic fluid is used to turn the drive motors. To brake, the driver just eases off the throttle, and the flow of fluid to the drive motors is reduced or stopped. So it's similar to a forklift. And what we're able to do is by throttling it up and back and slowly putting it into reverse, we actually use it as negative pressure, which creates us to be able to stop it. When it's rolling, the driver gets a little help from an operator riding on the rear of the harvester. It's his job to make sure the conveyor system plucking the carrots is operating as designed. By the time the workday is done, they pick 500,000 pounds of carrots, enough to fill 2.7 million three-ounce bags for kids' lunchboxes. If driving 32 tons of vehicles seems like a handful, this next seat weighs just a fraction of that and travels at breakneck speeds. Some of the fastest and most dangerous rides around are experienced from the driver's seats of two utterly different vehicles, speedboats and airplanes. Combining the best elements of each results in one of the wildest rides of all. Welcome to the driver's seat of a hydroplane. These boats are called hydroplanes, so hydro for the water and plane for the air. Here at Mission Bay in San Diego, California, professional hydroplane drivers are dueling for top honors at the World Series of Powerboat Racing. But first, the driver has to squeeze into a cockpit so small, the steering wheel has to come out before he can go in. So as you can see in the cockpit, it uh, seats one, barely. The cramped conditions are similar to the ones found behind the wheel of a Formula One or Indy style race car. And just like race car drivers, behind the wheel of a hydroplane, standard attire is a flame resistant suit. We have to have a fireproof suit just in case it catches on fire. Um, uh, we also have to have the shoes and the socks and the whole deal. Next is a helmet, certified helmet. You gotta have a crash lid. And in my case, I came across these uh, visors from the military that I've mounted onto my helmet in case there's glare, you know, I got a good visor. Underneath the helmet, he's wearing form-fitted earpieces that protect his ears from engine noise and keep him in constant contact with his team. It's also uh, works real good to keep the water out of your ears if you're upside down. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes that'll happen. Anyone in the driver's seat of a hydroplane also wears a specialized neck brace, called a Hans device, which keeps the head and neck secure during even the most brutal crashes. Sometimes we're in so tight, it's hard to breathe at first, but you get, you get used to it. And then last but not least, very critical, is our air mask. And it's, a, it's like an F-16 fighter mask. Got my communication in here. It seals really tight to my face. In case we are upside down, the cockpits will fill up with water. The only thing hydroplane drivers need more than safety is stamina. It's just physically exhausting to be able to turn the steering wheel, run the canard wings, and just physically hold on and keep your head up and, and keep your focus is unbelievably exhausting. You know, it's not a paved track like you'd find typical in, uh, in auto racing. It's very bumpy and you're going through a turn at anywhere between three to four and a half Gs. It becomes extremely violent. Traveling at a max speed of 200 plus miles per hour, a hydroplane is the fastest thing on water. Though as the driver of one of these crafts knows, very little of the vehicle actually touches the water. In fact, the hydroplane is designed to keep as little of the boat in contact with the surface as possible. Essentially, it flies over the water. 
here's how it works. The bottom of the craft is flat, but the deck is a smooth curve, shaped like the edge of an airplane wing. The design forces oncoming air to travel slower over the top of the craft than the bottom, creating lift. Ideally, only the propeller remains in the water to provide propulsion. A hydroplane relies on air pressure to, uh, to run. So it's, you know, it's got a tunnel in the middle and the sponsor's on the outside, and the air rushing through there actually suspends the boat above the water. And due to the fact that we got a lot of aerodynamics, we have a front wing now that we run with our left foot, and I can actually bring this thing down and create lift and get the nose of the boat to come up, which is pretty dangerous, especially when it's windy. And then if we get going too fast, I can just bring it back down. So we literally just fly the boat. But the craft's aerodynamic shape and its front wing aren't the only design features that make the experience behind the wheel less about boating and more about flying. The most commonly used engine in hydroplanes is a 3,000 horsepower turbine, the same one used on the Army's hulking Chinook helicopters. As this driver races atop the water at more than 200 miles per hour, he's riding a fine edge between control and catastrophe. Generate too much lift, and the results could be fatal. In July 2010, at a race on the Detroit River, a malfunction sent JW careening toward a seawall crowded with spectators at 70 miles per hour. The wreck could have been life-threatening, but thanks to the arsenal of safety equipment inside the driver's seat, JW only suffered a broken foot. I'm extremely lucky. The cockpits that we have now are unbelievably safe. You know, nobody, when they engineered these cockpits, never ever would have thought of a scenario going straight into a, into a wall. Yeah, I got a broken foot, but that's a big deal. On the glassy water, over rough terrain, and through smoky skies, some of the most action-packed moments in life happen in the driver's seat. All it takes is an expertly designed vehicle, a mastery of the controls, and the will to push the limits. And a driver can do amazing things without ever leaving the seat.